G'day, I'm Colin Vanguard. The show is Speaking With Horses on TV Santa Barbara. I'm here with the beautiful Sarah Lyons, a trainer and magnificent rider, I must say that. And it's a fantastic show about you and your horse and how they relate. Gonna see you on it, mate. Speaking With Horses is a series that wants to illuminate the why of horse-human relationships. How humans can relate to horses in a more comprehensive, clear, and compassionate way. And how that can be translated to support health and happiness in both horses and humans. Colin Dangard is our guide. This Aussie horse whisperer has been riding and caring for horses his entire life. By the age of 14, he had spent months at a time in the outback catching, taming, and living among the wild horses there. Colin visited the Glen Annie Ranch in the foothills of Goleta, where he met with Sarah Lyons, a trainer for SRL Sport Horses. All right, Sarah, wow, this is some place, Glen Annie. Glen Annie Ranch. So oh, you're the trainer, of course. <laughs> I am one of the trainers at this facility, so I work with a variety of different breeds of horses in different disciplines. This is my jumping arena that I mainly work with. This is primarily where I give the majority of my lessons. I love this quiet space here. And with all of the diversity between the trees, the pond, we get deer, coyotes, it's a great place for a horse to learn to be comfortable in a natural environment. You, as a trainer, training the horse. We go through all of the steps and you're an expert at recognizing where the horse is making progress, where it's not, where to back off, mm -hmm. where to reward, mm -hmm. uh, things to watch for. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the theory of just looking at looking through the glass on, from the other side this way, okay. that the horse is now training you. The horse doesn't like the pull on the bit, so he does something and you sure. soften the bit. The sure. horse thinks, wow, this is it. If I do that, she gives me what I want. Can I go back on your question a little? When you say that the horse is softening, and then I give and they get the reward. That's where you have that symbiotic relationship of we're giving together. We're both rewarding each other. That's where the ultimate communication takes place. So what are the signs that the horse is not accepting what the rider wants to do? You look for resistance. The biggest resistance you can see with a horse is one of two things. It's either backing up or it's refusing to look at whatever the object is. It can be a jump, it can be crossing water, it could be something that's funny looking out on the trail. Say a horse doesn't want to go through water, water's reflective. They see the reflection, they see things moving within the water. Horses will tend to want to turn around. Or if you have a jump that's, say, white, it's really reflective in the sunlight, it's bright. That's going to be more intimidating to a horse or a rider pair. If you can get the horse to keep going forward, whether that's at a walk, a trot or just being able to stand still without resisting back, you're going to start being able to build their confidence and then you can feel less of that resistance or unwillingness to go forward. Horses get frustrated, people get frustrated. The more you get frustrated, it's going to be a little harder to want to participate. It's going to be a little harder to keep the focus. What are these specific signs that the horse exhibits so the person on the horse can now go, oh yeah, I saw the horse do this, I saw it do that. It's accepting me, it's okay. calm. Look at your horse's ears. Are they receptive to you? Or are they looking around? Is your horse disfocused or over fixated on something else? You always want to have at least one ear on you. So one ear back and maybe one ear forward or listening. When you have an ear on you, you have your horse's focus. Or if you can find the idea that your horse is fixated on something else, like say there is an obstacle that's scary, like a big white barrel or a bag flapping out on the trail, just blowing a piece of trash. If you have both ears and the horse is starting to turn with its eye overlooking at whatever the fear factor is, if you can simply talk to your horse or lightly vibrate just with a ring finger to resupple them into the bridle, you have their focus back. And as soon as they take that deep breath like we do, you can feel them being relaxed. Let's go to that, uh, you're riding along in the trail okay. and uh, a, a, a bag is flapping. Horse goes, oh, it shies off, it does something, but it's now fixated on that bag. Mm -hmm. So 
What, what does the rider do to correct this shying away to, what does he do? What I typically do is the specific side that the object is not on, say if the object in question is on the left side, I supple the horse lightly with my right ring finger, as in supple them in away from the object, have them focus on what I'm doing and what I'm asking of them. If they give to me, that's their opportunity to have a positive reward than having to be pulled away from a questionable object. So no, not only did they not focus on the questionable object, they also got a reward for being good under saddle. So it also furthers their training and also strengthens our communication and their trust within me. Yeah, what about the, uh, uh, the theory that, okay, the, the rider is on the horse approaching mm -hmm. the jump. Mm -hmm. The rider looks at the jump and as you say, tends to fixate on it. There's a, there's a theory that, uh, that the horse actually is seeing what you are seeing. They, they get the picture that the rider has transmitted. Horse picks it up and the horse is now fascinated. Wow, she's looking at this jump, I should look at it. So they stop and look at it. Yes. Rider goes over the top of the, the, the deal. Squeeze at the face, perfect. You think a certain thing mm -hmm. and intuitively the horse thinks mm -hmm. a certain thing, the mm -hmm. same thing. Much like you and I are having this conversation, mm -hmm. you know what I'm thinking, I know what you're mm -hmm. thinking. Don't need a lot of words for that really. There's the theory that mate, this is what the horse is doing. The horse mm -hmm. is reading you, mm -hmm. reading your picture. Mm -hmm. You want the horse to jump that jump? Well, look at it. You've already in your mind seen that jump. You're looking at the next jump. Now, if mm -hmm. we create that picture of the horse going over the jump, horse picks up the same picture. Mm -hmm. They have an electromagnetic field. We have an electromagnetic field. If we're in sync with that, the signals can transmit. Naturally, horses are herd animals they are going to be receptive to who their leader is. Whatever the obstacle to overcome is, if the leader is second guessing, they are going to follow the message of the leader. The more you can make the rider feel comfortable, that's gonna start transferring over to the horse and then the horse is gonna feel that confidence. You use the word transfer there, so mm -hmm. what we've established is the credibility of the horse to be so so susceptible Absolutely. and receptive of our of our of our smallest changes mm -hmm. in feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can transmit fear to the horse in that way, mm -hmm. how do we transmit positive stuff? Uh, the horse has now done something that you like. What are the uh, and uh, lots of people give him a carrot, give him a treat, something okay. like that. But you're out in the trail, you, or you're or you're in the arena, you sure. don't have a treat, so. What are, the, what are the handy, nice treats that the horse really likes? Well, speaking to them, telling them they're good. They might not directly understand your verbatim English words, but they understand the comfort in your voice, the happiness in your voice. That's relaxation, that give of the rain, that softening on their mouth, as we talked about before. Freedom and reward is the best gift you can give a horse. So you need to be receptive off of the horse's body language like we talked about earlier, being receptive about their ears, their focus, the lip licking, the relaxation, then flatlining their necks and giving, stretching down to the point where their pull, the highest point of their heads is at their withers. That's when you see them relaxed. That's all body language. And the softer we are and the more giving we are, that's when the horse is also being receptive off of our body language. That's where you can have that symbiotic relationship of the horse not only teaching us, but us teaching them. It's simple in that way. You need to be willing to come down to the level of wanting to learn. But you will always get better the more you practice and the more you're willing to modify, but keep looking forward to the end result, is being happy with the horse and living that dream. Just up the road from Sarah's jumping arena, Colin met Kylie, who lives in Santa Barbara and boards two horses at Glen Annie Ranch. Both horses have had harrowing lives and she is responsible for saving both animals. So we have Kylie and we have Dream. <laughs> Kylie rescued Dream. Tell us about that, Kylie. Well, I needed to find a horse and I went through a rescue organization up north when we were living in Oregon and uh, Dream it comes from Washington. She was part of an animal control seizure 
and um, there was a breeding program up there, and there were about 28 horses near starvation. Actually, one of the horses didn't make it. She was severely emaciated, um, and she had to be rehabbed for nearly a year. You know, she's doing incredibly well today. In fact, we're doing some light riding. Um, she likes to canter, and she feels good most of the time. At the rescue organization, she said, this is the perfect horse for you, because I told her I'm a beginner. I don't know anything about horses, and it's been sort of a lifelong dream to have a horse. And in fact, I got a horse named Dream, <laughs> because her registered name is Girlish Dreams. So what has Dream taught you? She has taught me so much. She would let me get on her back, make mistakes, and forgive me all the time. In what way did she change your life? Well, she taught me patience. She taught me that it takes time to do things and it, ha it can't necessarily be on a schedule and that you have to adjust and be flexible. She taught me how to be calm and be in control of my emotions and realizing her calmness can be my calmness and we can reflect each other like a mirror. So she's, she's made a big impact on you. You've learned so much. How has this helped you in, say, your relationship with your husband, say? How, has that helped you? Yes, I, because we've had a lot of things to work through. I've had a couple of heart surgeries and wow. um, a couple of lung surgeries. Wow. Uh, due to congenital heart disease that I had as a child. And uh, so, you know, having to recover, it was a long recovery period, and knowing that you you know, any challenge can be overcome. And we've, we've had to overcome those challenges together. And uh, she's helped with that, as well as the relationship with my parents, because my parents have had a lot of medical issues in the last couple of years. My mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's a few years ago, and now she's very advanced. And coming out to the horses is like therapy for me. It's peaceful, calming and centering uh, and gives me a perspective on you know what's important in life and that's been difficult for my husband too it's been uh, those issues we've been able to overcome them together and in fact my husband who has had no relationship with horses <laughs> whatsoever he will come out here and read and he finds it therapeutic for him too even though he doesn't ride although I'm still trying to get him on a horse but well, this is amazing. It's like two wounded warriors of life have got together to help each other. Yes, yes, it's exactly that. And I always had a dream to own a horse as a child. Um, and now my dream has come true, you, literally. <laughs> so, <laughs> is it, that's right. the dream. <laughs> yes, double. I've got a double dream. That's beautiful. Now, that is the story. That is the story right there. But that's only really half the story. Kylie adopted another forsaken horse. This one she named Blossom. She was four when I got her. And uh, uh, she, was, she was a drop off at a feed lot. She didn't even run through auction. So her name was Blossom? Yes. And Blossom was on the way to the slaughterhouse? Yes, I actually I purchased her 36 hours before the truck arrived. I just couldn't stand the thought of her, her life ending that way. And um, so she, she has been um, just a remarkable horse. She's incredibly smart. Um, and, and that was part of my problem too, is that I didn't realize how complex emotionally and uh, intellectually these animals are. They aren't simple creatures, you know, and they're observing things, subtleties all the time, your insecurities, your upset one of our first lessons, she actually kicked me. And at that point, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work out, you know. Uh, she doesn't like me that much or something. But it was more about listening to the horse. It was about what we were doing and how we were doing it. And she's a horse that does not like to be drilled on things. So at that point, you, you, you learned a lesson yourself that you found out what she tolerates. And when you got to that level, she gave you a nice friendly kick to tell you, hey, that's it, I don't like that, and drilling, I don't like that. So, in effect, this beautiful horse was 
in effect training you a little on where you could go with her. Yes, right? yes. She was telling me, and, and you know, that's how horses communicate. Biting and kicking is, is a way they communicate with each other. So it's not something to be taken personally, you know, because that doesn't mean she hates me. That's mean she, it means that she was trying to tell me something. And uh, most of the time uh, now I can get it in a very subtle way just by a look or just merely touching them and feeling that their muscles are tense or just the, the way their ears are. Or, you know, there's so many subtle body language and she's also picking up on my body language. So if I'm nervous and fearful and after she kicked me that time and that was, you know, very early in our relationship, I was very fearful with her. I did not want to approach her. I didn't want to tack her up. And so is your, is your fear getting less as you Oh, yes. So as you uh, oh, yes. Her? I mean, I love this horse. She is so trustworthy now. Um, and, and I realized it was about mutual respect and patience again. Uh, that word comes to mind. Um, and and having a sense of empowerment, which actually Dream gave me, um, because she helped me build on, on my confidence so that I could work with Blossom and feel more secure. So in some ways, uh, Dream prepared you to work with Blossom? Yes. Well, the show is Speaking With Horses, and obviously you have learned these horses rather have taught you how to speak yes, with the horses, right? Right. right. <laughs> they have. They've given me their book uh, translations, so um, <laughs> they've translated things for me. That's wonderful. Two beautiful horses. Thank you. Blossom and dream. That's right. A they... dream that has blossomed. <laughs> <laughs> when I flex that fetlock on the left side. The last stop on Colin's tour of the ranch was with Will Friday, a practitioner of the Masterson Method, an interactive system of equine massage and body work. Will was just beginning a session when we showed up. Hey Will, what are we doing here? <laughs> well, we're just cleaning her feet up a little bit before we start to work on her. This horse does uh, hunter jumping and uh, dressage, and uh, it's a rescue horse, pretty amazing. And a Mustang. And a Mustang. As well. Uh, <laughs> This place is full of uh, rescue horses and they've turned out to be wonderful horses. They really can be and it's, um, it's really wonderful to see them getting a, another chance um, to do their job and to contribute. So, so uh, you're going to test this horse for any soreness? Yeah, we're going to go through her body um, and put just a little bit of pressure on her, the various junctions in her body to see if she's got any soreness or tension um, there. Sometimes that's just through normal work that our horses do, sometimes it's through injury or trauma. Um, so we'll just see what she has to say. And it's really, I think it's of it as a conversation with the horse about how she's feeling. Because we need to, to tune in and listen to them. But we need to listen like a horse, not like a person. Because we have our own mindset of how we, we interpret those things. And it's different than what horses do. Give, uh, give somebody a few indicators about how they can do that. How do you listen like a horse? and think like a horse, and uh, respond like a horse. I think the first thing is you have to throw away the clock, and you have to be present right here, right now. Our horses don't stand around and say, what do you want to do later? Should we go up over there? Or they don't stand around and say, that was some good alfalfa we had this morning, wasn't it? <laughs> They're thinking about what she is thinking about what is happening right here, right now. I think that's one of the greatest lessons we can get from the horse is to be here right now. The, the horse lives in the moment, lives now. However, if the horse is out on a trail and here's a mountain lion in these hills, which there are mountain lion out sure. there, here's a mountain lion and he goes, oh, like that. Well, it hasn't seen the mountain lion, so it has a memory of a mountain lion or fear or something. Explain that. That's the flip side. They live precisely in the moment and they remember everything. And so they remember the sound, the smell, the sensation of the mountain lion. They see, hear, smell, feel far more than we can even imagine. Their level of sensitivity all over their body is what we feel in our fingertips. They can feel a fly land on their butt in a windstorm. And they say lots of this information comes through those whiskers. Exactly, yeah. Each, each whisker has a, a neuroreceptor in the brain. And right now she can't see my hand. This is a blind spot for her. And that's how they can pick out that sweet little kernel of oat from the oat hay 
and they can pick out that right, the right piece of grass that they want to eat off the out in pasture. And every single one of these is, is highly sensitive. So right now she can't see my hand, you know, I'm down in her blind spot, but she, she can feel it, she can smell it, she can sense it. You know, people ride horses, they sit on horses and they always say, oh, I feel so good riding the horse. And when I'm sitting on the horse and I've had a bad day, I sit on the horse, well, all of a sudden the bad day has gone away. You feel great. Now, I've read some theories that uh, it's all scientific, that these have an energy field, an electrical field, so do we. Uh, we wear rubber shoes and we live in big buildings now, being modern man. But we get on this horse and it's plugged into the ground. There's, there's the energy of the heart in horses and humans radiates outward. And they've done scientific studies on this and it's called the Heart Math Institute. And they've used heart rate variability, the, the difference between a relaxed state and an active state and the recovery for that. And they've measured it in horses and they've measured it in humans. And they've recognized that the, because the horse is a larger animal, their heart is larger, that energy radiates out further. And that you create these sort of concentric circles of that energy and it's a healing energy. What's a good way to get fear out of a horse? From my bodywork background, I'm gonna look for those places where the, that fear is housed in their body from their past. Because remember, they, they remember everything. Um, so we'll look for places where they've got restriction and soreness in there and treat that as an emotional as well as a physical condition there. And we have a saying in this type of work is that a physical problem left untended becomes a, an intellectual problem. An intellectual problem left untended becomes an emotional problem. An emotional problem left untended becomes a spiritual problem. And we'd like to get to that problem when it's still a physical problem and not have to peel away all those extra layers. One of the techniques that, um, that we use, it tr traces along the horse's bladder meridian. It goes from the pole all the way along the top line and into their tail, down to the, the hind legs. And when people ask me to come out and do sessions of bodywork with them, I show them a few of these techniques that are so simple. Could we go over those techniques sure. again? The levels of pressure we use in this type of bodywork, um, Jim Masterson created this and he came up with a real simple way to describe it. The first level of pressure is air gap where I'm not even touching her. And we're actually connecting with her and allowing her to release. The next level is what Jim calls. Um, I can see that, just not to interrupt, but I saw the eye drop. Right. When you didn't even touch the horse. Right. Now I'm just touching her at a level of pressure. Imagine if you cracked a fresh egg on a plate and you just touched the yolk enough to dent the yolk a little bit. Well, we call that level of pressure egg yolk. The next level of pressure is imagine we put a grape on the plate and we're gonna squish that grape. Well, that's called grape pressure. The next level of pressure is called lemon. You wanna get some juice out of a fresh lemon. And the last one is lime. So now without having to talk about foot pounds per square inch or anything like that, you perfectly understand the levels of pressure that we talk about. Fascinating. Some trainers will use a, a corollary where they'll say air, hair, skin, muscle, bone. So when you're at air-like pressure, you're, you're barely touching the horse. When your hair, you're just touching it. Skin, you're putting a little pressure on them, and on and on. And the, the old saying in horsemanship is we want to do as little as possible, but as much as necessary. So in, in the body work, if I can operate at that air gap to egg yolk to grape level of pressure, rather than go to the lemon and lime, I'm really respecting the horse's natural responses to pressure. So their temporomandibular joint, can you turn for the camera there, sweetie? is right here, and it's where their jaw meets the skull. There's two little bumps, and it's like a saddle almost. And if we just touch her in there at air gap, I'm gonna step here next to you. We'll see her blink. And sometimes people will say, well, horses blink all the time, you know? It's like, they do, but we wanna see if they're blinking in response to something that we're doing. And here's where we throw the clock away, we don't go, 30 seconds and then we're moving on to something else. We're just waiting for her to do it, for her to release there. And we watch and she's thinking maybe the answer's over here. But that little fidget quite often leads to licking and chewing in the next level. What does the horse do in the natural environment that imitates what you are doing here in this artificial environment? Great question. Well, when you're, when you're done with your ride and you unsaddle your horse and you put him in the turnout, what's the first thing they do? Roll. <laughs> they roll. That's their self-adjustment. And, and what's the first thing the horse does after they get up? Shake. They shake. Now, are they shaking the dust off? No. No, that's a high, that's, the shake is one of the highest order releases we can, 
look for. What are some things that are really good for the horse to get them to release? Apart from taking off the saddle and letting them roll and doing it uh, their way, is there something that we can do? Well, again, that, that mantra of search, response, stay, release um, will guide you to where the horse would like you to you know, help them release tension. And one of the key places that I work with a lot is just in the heart region here, and there's the two pectoral muscles and a, and a bit of a groove in between. And if I just gently go through there at that air gap, she's already blinking. Head is dropping. And so this simple point, there's a sigh. She's a sigh, yep. So these are heart and lung points in traditional Chinese medicine. And that's a beautiful thing to do. That's easy. It's so easy. And all you have to do is, is soften and relax and, and get on horse time. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. And then there she's going to lick and chew. So the, the lung points in traditional Chinese medicine are, they're the gateway between the internal and external world. Mm -hmm. And so they can be very emotional release points for the horse as well and human. So. And right now you're releasing endorphins and that's indicative of the, of the shape of the position of the head, the uh, heaviness of the eyes, the slapping of the lips, which was happening a while ago, not that's now. Right. Um, and that's really a relaxed horse. And, and, another, and the only thing you're doing is just feeling between the pectorals. I'm, I'm asking the horse to direct their natural healing energy to that spot. And I'm basically giving her permission to let it go. Rather than come in and say, I, I need this from you right now. This is me saying, I'm giving this back to you right now. And another real simple thing that anybody can do, we often do this when we ask them to, to put on the bridle and take the bit is, I'm gonna slide my thumb into the bars there and put my thumb under her tongue and let her just work her tongue. All I'm doing there is asking her to, and look at her salivating there, she's already in that relaxed state. But I'm just asking her to move her tongue, which goes up into the TMJ, and I just stay really soft with her. You're okay, baby. She's like, we just met and you're sticking your hand in my mouth. And this is something that anybody can do and you're not gonna get bitten because there's no teeth in there. And if you just stay soft, now if we step back, she'll lick and chew for a little while and maybe go to another level of, of release there. The Masterson method doesn't really stretch the horse. They allow the horse to move through the range of motion in a position of comfort where they do the work of releasing. So that's it for our first episode. We hope you can take some of what we've learned here today to engage the world around you in a more connected, compassionate, and meaningful way. Join us again next episode for more of Speaking with Horses. Lessons.